Ladies and gentlemen, good afternoon. Maids, I should also say. It's nice to see a few of you here. I'd like to begin by thanking Dublin City Archives for inviting me here today to talk to you about the Maids of the Mountain Hockey Club. This club was founded in 1918 and after a very interesting and a very illustrious history, uh, we merged with Three Rock Rovers in 1999. And as Aideen said, to mark the, the 81 year history of this very unique club, myself and another maid, Orla McKeown, who is sitting in the audience down there, uh, along with a lover, n number of other maids and a former vice president, we co wrote the book entitled The Lilac Years, which was a history of the Maids of the Mountain Hockey Club. The name, the Lilac Years, will become a little bit more obvious as my talk proceeds. Uh, but Orla, as I said, is also here today, so although I'm the one who took the, drew the short straw and is up, standing up here talking, yeah, any difficult questions, you can put them that way. <laughs> <laughs> so the structure of today's talk will begin with a look at the start of the club, the maids who made it, the history, the achievements both on and off the pitch, and as well as the other maids who made it in other walks of life. When myself and Orla began researching the book, we were struck by the fondness that so many maids look back on their years with the club. And we also were struck by the level of very deep friendships that were made and continue, even to this day. Um, there was definitely something very special about Maids Hockey Club. When we went to, our, uh, to research the book, we found that the official records dated back to 1929, which we thought was actually very impressive. But since then, the book was published about 10 years ago. Since then, we've actually unearthed the records going back right to 1918, so right to the start of the club. And we're delighted that they are now uh, being housed in Dublin City Archives, and we've been liaising with Ellen, um, and they should be on show. I think it's kind of next year, I think, they should be ready to be, um, to be available for all to see, which is great. So as I said, Maids was established in 1918. And if we think in 1918, it was, a, it was an era of real tur turmoil in Irish history. We had many young Irish men fighting in France, and indeed many of the early maids uh, had family members and friends who were actually caught up in this war. It was only two years since the 1916 Rising, and it was also the year that Sinn Féin won the big uh, landslide general election. So times are really changing. Now, the founder of the club seems to have been, certainly from the research, the prime mover was a woman called Hilda O'Reilly. She actually herself married a World War I veteran. Other names that are associated with the establishment of the club are Mary Martin, who was a sister-in-law of Hilda, a woman called Dorothy Avery, Evie O'Kelly, Mary Mahoney, Vera Mahoney, later to become McWheeney, Dorothy O'Reilly, Nancy Piggott, and Marjorie Martin. The common theme was the link that these people had with Three Rock Rovers Hockey Club, as many were wives, sweethearts, sisters, or children of Rovers players. Hilda herself was born in 1898 and she was the youngest of eight children and from what we can gather was a very happy and optimistic sort of person who seems to be well liked by most. Hockey was a very popular pastime within her own family and both her father and her brothers played the sport and indeed her brother went on to captain the Irish hockey team when it won a, a triple crown in the 1920s. Hilda herself was a very talented hockey player and she went also on to win many caps for her country as also been given the captaincy of the Irish lady hockey team in the 1920s. So I'd say the O'Reilly parents would have been very proud of both their children. So what about the name? Although the name, has been, the, the name of the club has been varied in many ways, Maids of the Mountain, also known as Hags of the Hill, Whores of the Moors, the Bitches in the Ditches, that's purely not, I'm just quoting, the tarts of the town and so on. The actual correct name originates from a, an operata entitled The Maid of the Mountains, which was being performed at the Gaiety Theatre in the August of 1918. Now, other shows that were running at that time were Society's Driftwood and Bought and Paid For, but they were deemed not to be obviously appropriate. <laughs> the operata itself was written by an Englishman, Harold Fraser Simon, and it's a musical comedy in three acts, very popular because I'd say none of us have ever, <laughs> anybody ever heard of it? <laughs> the colours then chosen, as I said, remember what the lilac here is, the colours chosen to represent this new club was a purple tunic with a mauve shirt corresponding with the colours of the heather on the mountain. And if you played hockey in the, for maids in the 1929-1930 season, subscriptions were one pound, three shillings about approximately 140 in today's terms. In 1965, the sub was 
two pounds and 15 shillings. And after decimalization, the sub had increased to three pounds, 25 pence in the 71-72 season with a late fine payment of 25p. <laughs> Things have changed a bit now. The Irish Ladies Hockey Union was founded in 1894 and it actually is the very first women's hockey association established throughout the world. I know the hockey players here will remember but we hosted the 1994 Hockey World Cup and it was for the reason to commemorate the establishment of the Irish Women Hockey, or the centenary should I say, of the Irish Ladies Hockey Union. By 1918 the sport of lazy hockey was fairly strong but there was a limited number of clubs in existence and they were mainly closed for people who were either past pupils or uh, employees. So with virtually no open clubs available, we can only assume that Hilda, along with her friends, decided to establish their own club. And in 1920, with the club having only completed two seasons, Maids won the treble of the Irish Senior Cup, the Leinster Senior Cup, and the Leinster Senior League. Now, that's very impressive for a very new club. But it also shows how silly the other clubs who were closed weren't allowing such wonderfully uh, gifted players playing for them. This proved not to be once off and the club became a very dominant player in Irish hockey over the next 15 years, winning Irish Senior Cups, Leinster Senior Cups, Leinster Leagues, and in 1923 the club won the Irish Junior Cup, now known as the White Cup, with their second 11. So you can see that in a very short space of time the club had increased its playing membership. Now that's quite small and I appreciate that. You mightn't see all that, but it's, it's, it was hard to, to include all the international maids because members of the club achieved a lot of success both at international and at provin inter provincial level with all the provinces represented. And in, Irish, in, in old Irish hockey, we would have six provinces. We won't go into that. A total of 32 maids achieved international success, hence the size of that, with the honour of the top-capped player going to a woman called Ros Hewitt, who won 22 caps between 1931 and 1947. And then we have a Dorothy Lavery uh, between 1920 and 26, and Joan Shaw in the 60s and 70s, who both won 13 caps, and a H. Wallace, who won 10 caps between 1923 and 1926. Now, bearing in mind the, the links that Maids had with Three Rock Rovers, it's not surprising that the club's first grounds were actually that of the grounds of Three Rock Rovers. They were located at Fox Rock, near, Stilorgan, near the Stilorgan station on the Harcourt Street line. And those grounds had actually been given to Three Rock by Sir John Power of Power's Distillers. In 1930, Three Rock moved to La London Bridge Road, the headquarters of the Irish Hockey Union, down in Ring's End. Maids, however, remained in Fox Rock until 1934, when the club submitted a written application to the Men's Hockey Union for participation in the Temple Oak Grounds and Pavilion Scheme. And it was a relative of the men of the uh, Maids member, a man called Mr Devere White, again a theatre connection, undertook to produce a play at the Peacock Theatre to raise funds for the Grounds Guarantee. Maids, a first, again was the first tenant club of the female part of the Temple Oak Grounds. Many very happy years followed, and I'm sure a lot of these great memories would be here today as well, uh, followed in Temple Oak. A pavilion was established and it was made available for the use of the tenant clubs with a social area and a changing room. However, it was only until the 1950s, or it was only in the late 1950s, that sharing facilities were provided for the women. And thanks for this development was due to the determination of one of the members, Joan Matthews, who later became Joan Blackmore. Upon joining, she was shocked to find that the showers were only available for men. So she took her views to the next grounds committee meeting with very little success. So the following week, she marched with soap and towel in hand into the men's dressing rooms to use their showers. Not surprisingly, the following week, a shower had been installed in the women's changing rooms. By the early 1980s, Maid's permanent home at the Temple Oak Grounds had been targeted by builders for development, some things never change, and was finally sold during the 1985-86 season. Maid's was homeless at that stage and they travelled around for hired pitches for both training and for playing. Part of the proceeds of the, the, the sale of the Temple Oak Grounds was divided between the three lady tenant clubs and a development of the Three Rock Rovers ground at Grange Road gave maids the opportunity to invest this money together with the Leinster Ladies Hockey Union in the building of a second artificial turf pitch at Grange Road. 
and the club moved to this location under a licence agreement with Three Rock Rovers in 1988. Maids remained in Grange Road as a licensee until a decision was taken in the spring of 1999 by Maids of the Mountain and Three Rock Rovers to merge their assets and become one club. And the name of Maids was lost forever. Not really, though. When women started to play hockey in the last years of the 19th century, the activity was regarded as being somewhat outrageous. And it was therefore important to avoid both parental and society disapproval. So participating in the hockey activities had to be carried out very discreetly. Hockey players wore a hat secured with a pin, a long-sleeved blouse buttoned to the neck, a stiff linen collar, a loose-blowing cravat-type tie, and a voluminous skirt long enough to conceal the ankles and high enough at the waist to tuck in the tie. No doubt they also played in stiff corsetry, elaborate petticoats and heavy woolen stockings. Their hair was worn in elaborate styles on the top of the head or at the back of the net. The neck. When Maid's Hockey Club was established in 1918, skirt lengths had started to rise just above the ankle, but otherwise the early players were attired much as described. Now, we obviously don't have a picture from the late 19th century, unfortunately, but that's one of the players from the 1920 team. So you can see the, the type of stuff they had to wear. God love them. By 1927, players were lo wearing loose-fitting tunics with pleats which were cut just above the knee, no doubt encouraged by the, uh, the upwardly creeping hemlines of the 20s. In 1936, the first pair of tights made their debut in maids, courtesy of Doris Findlater, who has just turned 101, am I right? Yeah, still alive and kicking. While on tour with the Irish team to Philadelphia, Doris made the purchase of a, of a pair of tights and she found they were a highly effective way to avoid what was termed the smile, which was the gap between the top of the stockings and the bottom of the drawers, which was sometimes on view. For the rest of the maids, unfortunately, they were forced to continue the stockings until well into the 1950s. By 1959, the touring team to Clendudno uh, had disposed of the ties, opened their collars casually, and had shed their stockings or tights in favour of knee-high socks. When socks became part of the official uniform, the colour chosen was that of lilac to match the skirts. Now you can imagine lilac socks would not be something that would be very easy to find. So they had to be white, it was white socks that had to be purchased and then they were dyed the official colour. But the socks had to be imported from Northern Ireland and due to customs they could only be imported half a dozen at a time. Um, in the 1970s, short sleeves became the norm and the tunic was finally abandoned in favour of the wrap skirt worn by hockey players today. So what about the maids, as I mentioned, the maids who made it in other walks of life? There were many, but today time is limited, so I'm only going to just mention a small few. The first one is a woman called Vera uh, Mahoney, later to become Vera McWheeney. She joined maids in the, in the 1920s and rapidly made herself known in Irish hockey circles, being selected to play for Leinster in 1927 for the first time. She went on to become an Irish international, gaining her first cap in 1932. Her playing dates and maids were accompanied by some of the greatest successes the club had known in its history. She was twice Leinster president between 48 and 49 and again in 55, 56. She's the only person ever to hold that uh, position twice. She made a unique contribution to Irish sport, firstly as a multidiscipline athlete, as well as representing Ireland in hockey. She also represented them in tennis and in croquet and in squash. But also after her playing days, she was particularly instrumental in bringing publicity to women's involvement in sport through her, her reporting career. And I'm sure some people here would remember her today. After her husband died, her husband Arthur died in 1958, he was a sports journalist and she started then to report on a freelance basis uh, for the Irish Independent, later moving to the Irish Times. And she reported on women's hockey, she reported on uh, women's tennis, badminton and squash. And her name was actually commemorated in the Vera McWheeney Shield, which was presented by the Irish Times to the, in 1981, just after her death, to the Leinster Indoor Under-21 Interprovincial Tournament as a tribute to her contribution to hockey in Ireland. As a journalist, she was always said to be very fair to up-and-coming players, and if she ever had a criticism to make of their play, her comments were always finished with a very, in a very positive and constructive note. She was very professional in her approach, and she, was made, she made sure to, to watch everything that she reported on. Former international tennis colleagues described her coverage of Wimbledon during the early 70s as brilliant. She also reported on all major tennis events in Fitzwilliam Lawn Tennis Club, then a bastion of male membership only. 
She is recalled fondly in Irish feminist circles for her no-nonsense approach to matters in the environs of Fitzwilliam. A report was reported after her death of an incident in Fitzwilliam when about to take a shortcut through the men's change rooms to get to a match, she was stopped. She told the steward that she had to get through and that if it bothered anybody, she, had tell them to, she used to tell them that she had seen better elsewhere. When Vera suddenly died in January 1980, those who knew her wouldn't have been surprised to hear that she died with the upcoming fixtures, the sports fixtures marked in her diary. Uniquely among the notable maids, Edith Hudson never actually played hockey for maids. Her main interest lay in the umpiring area. She was principal of Ling Phys Physical Education College for many years. Many of those graduates went on to join maids. She was renowned for her professional approach and a very meticulous attention to detail and a scrupulous sense of fairness and integrity in all her dealings. After Ling closed down in 1973 and the Physical Education College moved to Limerick, she found herself without a club and she was at in that stage invited to join maids. And when she did, she immediately became involved in the club's umpiring. Um, and um, although involved in maids, her, her main in energy was in the wider field of Irish and Leinster hockey. She was a grade A umpire who examined aspiring umpires for their exams. She also travelled with both Irish and Leinster touring teams representing, uh, represented Ireland at international symposiums on umpiring. She was a member of the FIH Rules Committee and was appointed a judge at the FIH Internet Continental Tournament in 1983 in Kuala Lumpur, um, which I'm, I'm hoping that many remember it was a tournament that we actually won. She held the Office of President and I don't think the men's hockey could actually say that. But anyway, we'll say, sorry, Robert. Um, she held the office of president of the Irish Ladies Hockey Union from 81 to 82, having been treasurer from 45 to 59. She also held the office of president of the Irish Umpires Association and was honoured with honorary life membership of the Irish Ladies Hockey Union, the Leinster Ladies Hockey Union, and the Irish Umpires Association. A very, very fine woman. But this is one of my favourites. It's a woman called Muriel Gahan, and her inclusion in the selection of maids, notable maids, it actually doesn't come from her hockey activities. We don't really know how good she was, but she certainly played with maids, and she, you can find her in the records. But really, it's her non-hockey activities that she, we could, you could fairly say that she had enormous influence on the craft industry in Ireland. She herself was born in Donegal in 1897 and reared in Castle Bar. Her, her, mother, her father worked for the congested district boards, and when he retired, they moved to Dublin in the 1920s, and it was then she joined maids. She joined the United Irish Women in 1929, which was later to become the Irish Country Women's Association. And one of her ma first major contributions to the movement was in the establishment of the country shop restaurant and workers, country workers in 1930. Mem again, many of you probably remember the country shop. It was located at 23 Stevens Green and was the meeting place for Maid's Hockey Club until its closure in 1978. She was directly responsible for the establishment of the Country Markets Limited, a cooperative formed jointly by the ICA and the Homespun Society. And she also was involved in the establishment of the Country Craftsmanship Scheme. She became the, the only female member of Ireland's first Arts Council in 1952 and in 1971 she set up the Arts, the Craft Council of Ireland. Throughout the years Muriel was very involved with the RDS and once again history was made when she became the first woman ever elected Vice President of the RDS. She was awarded an honorary doctorate from Trinity College in 1978 and in her long career with the United Irish Women and the ICA Muriel was elected Chairwoman of the National Executive on many occasions. It was through her contact with the Kellogg's Foundation that a grant was actually given to the ICA for the establishment of the, their residential centre on Greenall. The Irish American Cultural Institute endowed an annual development grant in her name, uh, the Muriel Gahan Scholarship, and it's awarded at the annual RDS craft competition during the RDS horseshoe. And it won't be surprising to know that she was known as MG uh, to all her friends because it paraphrased her dynamic character. And she died at the age of 97 in 1995. But nothing would be complete for maids without Rita. Rita was always very easy to spot coming to maids matches because she invariably travelled in a pony in a trap. She was a daughter of one of the uh, founders of Three Rock Rovers Hockey Club and she joined maids in, in September 1941. Although, although a successful hockey and lacrosse player gaining international recognition in both, it was actually as chairperson of the Irish Country Markets Association 
a position that she held for 14 years that she was better known. And it was Muriel Gahan who got her actually uh, asked her to take on that role. She was also she also served as president of the Irish Horticultural Society. And when Maids merged with Three Rock Rovers, it was fitting that Rita, given her deep connections to both clubs, became the first female president in 2001. A total of 20 maids achieved provincial and international success in a other wide variety of other sports, such as lacrosse, cricket, windsurfing, golf, tennis, Olympics, badminton, fencing, swimming, netball, croquet and squash. But as I said at the outset, the level of respect and fondness for the club of maids, given the, even given the name, was quite striking, both from within the club itself, but also from other clubs. And this is probably best illustrated by the poem that was penned for the club by Anne Cox in 1982, the then Leinster hockey president. And it goes as follows. We are the maids of the mountain. We hide in the gores and the fen. And someday we hope, if God spares us, to capture some wild mountain men. <laughs> we'll teach them the art of good hockey. We'll take off their trousers and shirts. We'll put on some wigs and some makeup and dress them in blouses and skirts. And when we have won all before us, we'll treat them to some mountain dew and help them, the, help them relax in the heather as maids of the mountain should do. <laughs> <laughs> the archival material that has been lodged by Maids Hockey Club, as I said, is very impressive. Uh, but however, these archives are much more valuable than just recording an 81-year history. They provide a very rare insight, we discussed this at lunchtime, a very rare insight of women in sport. It really helps to chart the socio-economic life of life in Ireland, the changing role of women in Irish society, and also the contributions made by so many women to so many aspects of Irish life. These all were the maids who made it. Thank you.